From the Rio Grande Valley, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be, across the nation, around the world, this is Out of the Ordinary. I'm your host, Mikey. Today I'll be talking to you all about Ed and Lorraine Warren. Let's say hi to a couple of people. Hi, Natalie. And uh, hopefully there's more people coming in. So let, let, let's, give them, let's give them a few to come right in. Hi, Liz. Let's just give them a few minutes to get on in. And Aka, Aka, hey. I thought Liz locked you guys up in the closet. <laughs> all right, all right. Shame on you, Aka, shame. <laughs> So, okay, we'll get to some other people and everything like that. And yes, Natalie, yes, the Warrens. Um, so Edward Warren Miney and Lorraine Rita Warren were American paranormal investigators and authors associated with prominent cases of the alleged hauntings. Edward was a self-taught and self-professed demonologist, author, and lecturer. Lorraine professed to be clairvoyant and light trance medium who worked closely with her husband. In 1952, the Warrens founded the New England Society for Psychic Research, the NESPR, the oldest ghost hunting group in New England. They authored many books about the paranormal and about their private investigations into various reports of paranormal activity. They claim to have investigated well over 10,000 cases during their career. The Warrens were amongst the first investigators of the Amityville haunting. According to the Warrens, the official website of the NESPR, the Vilglim magazine and several other sources, the NESPR uses a variety of individuals, including medical doctors, researchers, police officers, nurses, college students, and members of the clergy in its investigations. So it looks like we got a Cosmo in here. Hey, what's going on, brother? Welcome. Stories of ghost hauntings popularized by the Warrens have been adapted to have been adapted as or have indirectly inspired dozens of films, television series, documentaries, including several films in the Amityville Horror Series and the films in the Conjuring Universe. Yes, that's right. They did uh, They did inspire a lot of like the Conjuring and the Amityville horror movies. So Skeptic Skeptics Perry DeAngelis and Stephen Novella, Novella <laughs> investigated the Warren's evidence and described it as Blarney. <laughs> well, that's a new word, Blarney. <laughs> Skeptical investigators Joe Nickel and Benjamin Radford concluded that the better known hauntings, Amityville and the Sneed, Sneedker family haunting did not happen and had been invented. So these guys, these skeptics think that they had been invented, which who knows? Who knows? I'll leave that up to the viewer to, you know, figure that out. So notable investigations they've done in the past include... <laughs> Liz says, Blarney means fake, not true. Mickey Mouse, not genuine. Uh, <laughs> I learned something new. Snatch? What movie is that? I don't remember. <laughs> well, anyways, we can talk about that later. Um, so the, the investigations were of Annabelle, of course. That's the mo one of the most famous movies going around nowadays now. Um, According to the Warrens, in 1968, two roommates claimed that their Raggedy Ann doll 
was possessed by the spirit of a young girl named Annabelle Higgins. The Warrens took the doll, telling the roommates it was being manipulated by an inhuman presence. Put it on display at the family's occult museum, The Legend of the Doll inspired several films in the Conjuring universe and its motive in many others. Guess I caught Annabelle. <laughs> Which I think I think uh, Akka needs to do something about that damn doll, you know. <laughs> you and Hex, the Hexes needs to burn it. <laughs> so, the witch family. In 1971, the Warrens claimed that the Harrisville, Rhode Island, home of the Perron family, was haunted by a witch who lived there in early 19th century. According to the Warrens, Baths, Bathsheba Sherman cursed the land so that whoever lived there somehow died of terrible death. The story is subjected to the 2013 film, The Conjuring. Lorraine Warren was a consultant to the production and appeared in a cameo role in the film. A reporter for the U.S. Today covered that the film's supposed factual ground groundings <clears throat> excuse me so we get to the Amityville um so um man behind the uh, person behind the curtain uh, we're not talking about those ones yet we're talking we're just I'm just talking about the stuff that uh the Warrens investigated and stuff, and then we'll get to the other stories. So, the Amityville, as I, as you all know, oh, hello, Shelby Rugrin. I'm good. I'm good. So, the Amityville, the Amityville Horrors, if you all know, was a series of, of movies that basically had different types of, you know, horrific events happen. One of my favorite uh, movies of Amity of the Amityville Horror Series was one called, I think, uh, it has something to do with time. I'm, I'm not too sure what it was, but it had to do something with the clock. That, I remember, scared the crap out of me when I was little. <laughs> so anyways, the Warrens are best known for their involvement in the 1975 Amityville Horror, in which... New York couple George and Kathy Lutz claimed that their house was haunted by a violent demonic presence so intense, so intense that it eventually drove them out of their home. The Amityville horror conspiracy author Stephen and Roxanne Kaplan characterized the case as a hoax. Lorraine Warren told reporter for the Express Times newspaper that the Amityville horror was not a hoax. The reported haunting was the basis for the 1977 book, The Amityville Horror, and adapted into the 1979 and 2005 films of the same name, while also serving as inspiration for the film series that followed. The Warren's version of the events is particularly adapted and portrayed in the opening sequence of The Conjuring 2. According to Benjamin Radford, the story was refuted by eyewitnesses, investigations, and forensic evidence. In 1979, lawyer William Weber stated that he, Jay Anson, and the occupants invented the horror story over many bottles of wine. Oh, okay. Yeah. Much love. We appreciate it. So we move on to the next story here called the Enfield Poltergeist. In 1977, the Warrens investigated claims that a family in the North London suburb of Enfield was haunted by, a polter by poltergeist activity. While a number of independent observers dismissed the incident as a hoax carried out by attention-hungry children, the Warrens were convinced that 
It was a case of demonic possession. The story was the inspiration for The Conjuring 2, although critics say the Warrens were involved to be a far lesser degree than portrayed in the movie, and in fact had shown up to the scene uninvited and been refused admittance to their home. Guy Lyon Playfair, a parapsychologist who investigated the Enfield case alongside Maurice Gross, <laughs> Gross. What does that remind you of? Gross, man. <laughs> okay. Also say that the film greatly exaggerated by the war. Nom, 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 nom. The bones of chaos are coming for you. The bodies of chaos are coming for you. The bodies of chaos are coming for you. Oh my God, you see, I can't even say the name, man, because right away they have to interrupt my feed. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> All right, guys. All right. Enough playing around. <laughs> so, says that the film is greatly exaggerated the Warren's role in the investigations. He stated in 2016 that they turned up once and that Ed Warren told Playfair they could make a lot of money out of the case. He corroborated the claim and, and that the Warrens were not invited into the infield house and that nobody in the family had ever heard of him until Ed Warren turned up. Now we get to Arn Johnson. See, now Arn Johnson, I'm not too familiar with him or whoever it is. But let's, let's learn about it. In 1981, Arne Cheyenne Johnson was accused of killing his landlord, Alan Bono. <laughs> Bono. <laughs> Ed and Lorraine Warren had been called prior to the killing to deal with the alleged demonic possession of, a, of, his, of the younger brother of Johnson's fiance. The Warren subsequently claimed that the Johnsons were also, was also possessed at trial. Johnson attempted to plead not guilty by reason of demonic possession. Huh. Yes, yes, Aka. <laughs> Damn that Grossman. <laughs> Is what a thing, Aka. Uh, reason for demonic possession, reason of demonic possession? I don't think so. I mean, hell, I wouldn't, I, if I were a judge, I wouldn't believe someone like that. Oh, I was believed by a demon. No. No. <laughs> I'd be like, I sentence you to more demonic possession. <laughs> so... The story serves as an inspiration for The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It, in 2021. The case was described as the 1983 book, The Devil in Connecticut by Ger Gerald Brittle. I know, right? <laughs> WTF. The Snedaker Hound. I don't know how to say this. The Snedeker? Snedeker? But anyways, the Snedek I'm going to say Snedeker house. In 1986, Ed and Lorraine Warren arrived at the proclaimed Snedeker house, a former funeral home to be infested with demons. The case was featured in the 1993 book In a Dark Place. The story of a true haunting, a TV film that later became part of the Discovery Channel series, A Haunted, A Haunting, was produced in 2002. The Haunting in Connecticut, a film loosely based on the Warren's version of the events and directed by Peter Corn Cornwell, was released in 2009. Horror author, author Ray Garton, who wrote it wrote an account of the alleged haunting of the Snedeker House family in 
Southington, Connecticut, later called into question the veris vericity of the accounts contained in this in his book, saying the family involved, which was going through some serious problems like alcoholism and drug addiction, could not keep their story straight. And I became very frustrated. It's hard writing a nonfiction book when all the people involved telling you different stories. To paranormal investigators Benjamin Radford, Garton said, Lorraine, if she told me son, the sun would come up tomorrow morning, I'd get a second opinion. Oh. Hi, Stephen P. Kitty Cat. Oh, and okay, and uh, Mod from PBDC TV says Snyder. Snydecker. Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks for that. <laughs> I didn't. I, I. I didn't really know how how it was pronounced. You know. All right, the Smurl family. Let's see who these people are. Okay. Pennsylvania residents Jack and Janet Smurl reported their home was disturbed by numerous supernatural phenomena, including sounds and smells and apparitions. The Warrens became involved and claimed that the Smurl house was occupied by four spirits and also a demon that allegedly sexually assaulted Jack and Janet. The Smurls' version of their story was subjected to a, of an, a subject of a 1986 paperback titled the Haunted, and television film of the same name directed by Robert Mandel. Yeah, that's what I want to know, Matt. What's up with these names? <laughs> what is up with the whole demon possession thing? I mean, you know, they make, they make demons sound so bad. I mean, hexes in a car, they're not bad. I mean, the only thing is that I get a glitch in the time matrix and stuff like that. Hexes, you need to fix that. <laughs> the Union Cemetery. Ah, Wendigo Demon, huh? Hey, both the same. <laughs> it's all the same. It's all the same. <laughs> the Union Cemetery. Ed Warren's book, Graveyard, True Hauntings of the Old New England Cemetery, St. Martin's Press, 1992, features the white lady ghost which haunts Union Cemetery. He claimed to have been captured. At, he claimed to have captured her essence on film. So Ed and Lorraine Warren have gotten much criticism from many throughout the years. According to a 1997 interview with the Connecticut Post, Stephen Novella and Perry DeAngelis investigated the warrants for New England Skeptical Society, the NESS. They found the couple to be, to be pleasant people, but their claims of demons and ghosts be at best as tellers of the meaningless ghost stories and were, and at worst, dangerous frauds. They took 13 dollar tours and looked at all the evidence the Warrens had for spirits and ghosts. They watched the videos and looked at the best evidence the Warrens had. Their conclusion, it's all blarney. They found common errors with flash photography and nothing evil in the artifacts the Warrens had collected. They have tons of fish stories about evidence that got away. They're not doing good scientific they're not doing good scientific investigations. They have pre predetermined conclusion which they adhere to literally and religiously, according to Novella. Lorraine Warren said that the problem with Perry and Steve is that they don't base anything on God, Novella responded. It takes work to do solid critical thinking to actually employ your intellectual faculties and come to a conclusion that actually reflects reality. That's what scientists do every day, and that's what skeptics advocate. So, in an article for the Sydney Morning Herald, they examined whether supernatural films are really based on true events. 
the investigations was used as evidence to con to the contrary. As Novella quoted, the warrants claim to have scientific evidence which does, in, does indeed prove existence of ghosts, which sounds like a testable claim into which we can sink our investigative teeth. What we found, a very nice couple, some genuinely sincere people, but absolutely no compelling evidence. While it was made clear that neither DeAngelis or Novella thought the Warrens would intentionally cause them harm, cause harm to anyone, they did caution that the claims like the Warrens severed to reinforce delusions and confuse the public about legitimate scientific methodology. And this concludes the discussion of Ed and Lorraine Warren. Now let's get to talking to something, uh, some creepy stuff that happened here in and around my city. But let's go to commercial. This is Mikey from Out of the Ordinary, and you're watching PBDC TV. I'm listening to music and getting a little bit of time for some creepy research, I'm always representing with my PBDC merch. What a better way to have a cup of coffee in the morning. Don't forget to check out our other cool merch at RootsBleedRed.com. That's RootsBleedRed.com. This is Professor Redger Fluffosaurus from Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat, and when I'm not hosting Monster Chat or knocking down small Japanese cities, I'm watching PBDC TV. Now back to the show. All right, and we're back. Um, and uh, 
let's see here. Um, uh, let's see uh, where. Let's look at some comments here. Uh, Stan P. Kitty Cat says, ah, Mike is in my house. Uh, no, I swear I'm not in your house. I don't know who that person was on the radio. You know, that that wasn't me. I'm right here. <laughs> I'm in my house. <laughs> Possession is Hex's, what, bag? <laughs> then Channel 9 says, I think Mikey threw his voice. Um, It could be possible. It could be possible that maybe I glitched again and, you know, warped somewhere else. <laughs> warped to the radio. <laughs> Wait, who's the real Mikey? I'm the real Mikey, man. <laughs> All right, let's get back into here. So the first case, we, the first story we have is the monster of Lake Worth. And uh, the one behind the camera, can you show them who the monster of Lake Worth is? See, there is supposedly the picture of the monster of Lake Worth or a.k.a. the Goat Man of Lake Worth, Texas, which looks like a ball of cotton or something like that. But that's the closest picture they got to taking of this supposed, you know, cryptid. So let's get into what, what they have to say about it. It was, the, it was during the early hours of a steamy morning in the summer of 1969 that six terrified Fort Worth residents headed breathlessly for their local police station and told remark a remarkable tale john reichardt his wife and two other couples had been parked at a late at late worth when a strange beast jumped out of the trees at them covered in both fur and scales slammed into reichardt's car and tried to grab the hysterical miss reichardt before disappearing into the darkness its only calling card was an 18-inch long, an 18-inch long scratch along the side of the car. Legends of the Lake Worth Goatman thus begins. <clears throat> and uh, Natalie says, uh, "Ball of cotton." Yeah, well, it looks like a ball of cotton. <laughs> then Aka says, "Steamy morning." <laughs> What's going on there? <laughs> Why was it steamy and why were they parked? Yeah, I wonder why. <laughs> Newspapers published a fuzzy photograph of the monster. Well, <laughs> I'm going to say newspapers pu published a ball of cotton. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I got the giggles because of what <laughs> I just call it a ball of cotton. <laughs> Anyways, they posted a fuzzy photograph of the monster while other sightings were made. Local police investigated the claims but found no evidence of the monster in the Lake Worth and Greer Island area. Sightings of the strange animal had been discussed amongst locals and the neighborhood was on edge. Police kept careful watch on the unfolding drama but reports of the monster died down once the school semester resumed. Four decades later, many, including Alan Plaster. <laughs> what kind of name is that, Alan Plaster? <laughs> who, took who took the supposed photograph of the creature. Yeah, I don't want to say that's a ball of cotton. <laughs> Suspected that it... <laughs> there it is! <laughs> that it was a... <laughs> suspected that it was a hoax. Of course, it was probably a hoax. A ball of cotton. <laughs> the case was closed as juvenile pranksters rampaging around in some type of costume. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> All right. Uh, that was a little short one. Now, let's get to... <laughs> ah, evil ball of cotton. <laughs> now, let's get to the ghost children upon San Antonio's railroad tracks. So that is not an actual picture of the children on of you know the ghost or anything like that, but it's a uh, it, how can I say it's uh, it's portrayed as what it what it looks like. But let's read on about this because a lot of people, even even my mother, uh, may she rest in peace and everything like that. My mother claimed that you know it actually happened. 
So, ah, okay, artistic rendering, yes. So, according to a lot of people, it has happened. So, just south of San Antonio, Texas, is the site of Texas' most famous ghost story. Not far from San Juan Mission, and not, and I'm not talking about Mission, Texas. So this is called San Juan Mission. Is an intersection of roadway that is crossed by railroad tracks. Rather, it's an urban legend or truly a ghost story, ghostly tale has long been forgotten in history. Reportedly, this is the site of the fatal accident which a train collided with a school bus full of children in the 1930s or 1940s. According to the legend, it was a rainy Texas morning and the train moved swiftly down the tracks when the engineer spied a school bus stalled along its path. Frantically pulling his brakes and tugging on the train whistle, the hulking engine quickly advanced towards the bus, unable to stop in time. Ten children reportedly lost their lives that day and continued to haunt the area, protecting others from sim that similar fate. As the story goes, if you park your car directly over the tracks and shift into neutral, the ghost of the children will push it uphill, out of the way of an oncoming train. And if you have the foresight to cover your bumper with baby powder or flour, you can reportedly see the children's fingerprints upon your car. Who has tested that? My mother has. She uh, had told me uh, once that, that they did it, said it scared the shit out of her, but they actually did it. Not the whole, you know, powder on the, on the, on the bumper and like that, but there have been people that have tested it and everything like that, that, you know, they have seen the fingerprints and everything like that. But of course, then again, there's a lot of skeptics out there that don't believe it. This story has been featured on the popular television show of sightings, unsolved mysteries, as new, as well as numerous Texas magazines and newspaper, despite much, the much publicized story its truth has been hot, wholly debated in San Antonio, and both area residents and local law enforcement are weary of the legend. Numerous accounts have been reported that cars do in fact inexplicably move on their own, and mysterious prints are seen on the vehicle. Others allege that they have heard the voices of laughter of children while at the site. However, in support of San Antonio residents, there are no records of any such accidents having occurred in the newspaper archives anywhere in Texas. It seems to us that an accident of such magnitude would have been reported somewhere. And see, this is where this is where where I say that no, it 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 might have not gotten reported because, of course, you know how the how the news is and everything like that. They're not really keen on reporting a lot of things either. And of course they're, they had, they could have destroyed, you know, evidence and stuff like that of the reports and stuff, you know, just to bury that, you know, within, because there is a lot of like newscasts and stuff that the, yes, yes. Stephen B. Kitty cat. It's been covered up. Yes. I do believe it's a cover up. I do believe it. Furthermore, Official investigations into the events have determined that the that despite an illusionary appearance of a level or even slightly inclined road, the street surface is actually at two degree inclination uh, at a two degree de declination. This would result in a natural rolling of the car park in neutral. As to fingerprints, these could easily be those that were already there. Even after washing, forensic studies have concluded that fingerprints still can occur. Oh, come on. That is that is other that is other bull crap. That is other bull crap. If you wash your car, your fingerprints are not gonna be there anymore. Because you washed the oils off of them. <laughs> Anyhow, that concludes the story of the San Antonio children on the train tracks. Let's get into something here in my area. It's the Lalomita Chapel, the Mission Lalomita Chapel. 
Now, while that now while that chapel looks like it's nice and everything like that, there is a a sort of you know paranormal history, and this was taken from uh, the Progress Times. This is not my working or anything. This is from the Progress Times. Um. Anyways, there have been you know claims that there have been dark forces there, and that you know different things. I've had friends that have gone there, you know, ghost hunting and stuff like that. And then Acosta says, then again, I catch fire if I go into a church. <laughs> then Acosta says, too, creepy look, creepy looking action. Um, it doesn't, that's just a remodeled, um, that's just a remodeled version of that church. But when I was young, when I was little, that thing looked like really dilapidated and everything. Like, it looked like it was ready to fall. <laughs> oh, hi, Nadine. Welcome. So the Lalamita Chapel, the historic chapel, is the is in the city of Missions, namesake and home of one of the most benevolent ghosts on the list. Visitors who have come to pray have claimed to have seen the spirit of a nun suspended in the air in prayer posture and in broad daylight, Bao said. Despite the peaceful nature of this ghost, Bao said that the spirit is born from a sacrilegious incident. So let's see what happened. According to legends, there was a monastery nearby where some nuns had been had had been and they were being assaulted sexually by priests who forced the nuns to kill their babies born from their assaults and bury their babies underneath the chapel. The spirit seen there is one of the nuns keeping watch over her babies, Bell said. So now the, <clears throat> the chapel there that I showed you, okay, that's one haunted place. That's where you see the nun, you know, praying. But I can't really find pictures of the monastery place because it it's all burnt down. It burnt down. Now it's a, they rebuilt and it's a school now. But uh, yeah, the monastery, a lot of people back when I was in high school and everything like that, a lot of people would go and party there. And they would claim that they would see, you know, demonic forces and everything like that. They would see, they would see, um, you know, ghosts and stuff. They would hear things and stuff. So, yeah. So, it's a really horrifying thing that is that's not born out of any evidence, as there is no proof or records of a monastery with nuns who stayed there for a long period of time. People have cobbled together a story that is especially gruesome, which who knows? I mean, like I said, these things look like cover-ups to me. You are more susceptible when you're not sober. Uh-huh. Yeah. In his book, Bowles argues the backstory could not be real and instead said the spirit seen at the chapel, actually a vision of the Virgin Mary. Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, and then it says, she uses the place for people to see her. That's why people leave notes and prayers under the stones in the chapel, Bawa said, of La Lomita. So, that concludes the whole story about Lalomita. And uh, we got Mike Phelps in the house. Hey, yeah, Frank's here too. What's up, Frank? So now we go to another place here in the little town called Edinburgh, Texas. It's the old Hidalgo County Jail, which uh, that's it right there. Now, that, now, that place now is a museum. It's the Dalgo County Historic Museum. And from what I hear from many eyewitnesses and everything like that, that, that place used to be, was the last place where they did executions back in the day. 
And uh, can you show that again? So uh, show the picture again. At the top of the tower, at the very top, right there, that's it looks like a bell tower. That's where they would hang the people, convicts and stuff like that, or the death row inmates. They would hang them from there. So let's get into this. Built in 1909, the Hidalgo County Jail, which is now a wing of the Museum of South Texas History in Edinburgh, the county jail executed only one man, Abraham Abram Ortiz, who was convicted of sexual assault and murder and executed in 1913. No other hangings are on record. Ortiz was executed by public by being publicly hung from the jail's second story gallows. Local folklore says Ortiz's ghost haunts the jail by clanking his shackles, Bowel says. Um, he refused to let the executioner place a bag over his head so that he could look witnesses in the eye as he died, said Bowles. He threatened to continue clinging to this world as, this, as his last words, there is no heaven and hell. Hmm. Well, according to uh, according to hexes, there is. <laughs> Visitors in the museum can now visit Ortiz's jail cell, as it has become one of the museum's top attractions. When you sit there in the same spot he was at, you suddenly feel the cold feel a cold chill. Like a haunting presence is nearby, Bell says. Ortiz would always chuckle loudly inside his cell, and people have said that they have seen him and heard him, heard his chuckles when no one else is in the museum. And yes, that they they have claimed that they do hear strange noises. Uh, security guards have actually said that they do hear strange noises like that. That comes from the security guards. So that concludes the little story about the Hidalgo County, the Hidalgo County jailhouse. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying these uh, little stories that I'm telling you of, uh, you know, in and around my area. <laughs> now we go to the next one. It's called the Laborde House. And this is located in Rio Grande City, Texas. Located in Rio Grande City, the Victorian home turned hotel that was designated by French architects in 1893, house guests checking in for stay, and several ghost stories. Ooh. There are so many stories that can be told about that place, Bao said. It's really fascinating how each room has something connected to it. According to staff, two young girls died in the front well of the house and a man hung himself up in the upstairs room of the hotel, which has been managed and owned by the Star County Historical Foundation. Ownership completely embraces the paranormal reports here as staff have reported seeing full body apparitions, footsteps and physical contact from spirits. There are some people who think this who think it's the hotel just using these sightings as a marketing technique, but these stories have been around forever. Bao said it's a compelling series of ghost stories. <clears throat> so I know very little about the Rio Grande City, uh, the, the Laborde House, but I do know that um, in there, uh, there is Fort Ringgold. And I hear that you can see a lot of like uh, Confederate soldiers and stuff like that haunt that haunt that place, and a lot of like uh, I guess what you can say uh, because re remember back then there were Mexican slaves. So back in the, the days of the Confederacy and stuff like that, there were Mexican slaves and everything like that, and some of them died there. So you can actually see you know apparitions of things there. You know, there the Rio Grande City is. Pretty paranormal there, too. Huh. So now we talk about something very, very close to home. It is 
the Sherry Mansion or Sherry and the Sherry Memorial Chapel. Now, as beautiful as it looks, it does have, a, you know, a paranormal history to it. Now, let's get into it. The most well-known attraction in the city of Palmhurst, because it's since, okay, Mission converted to Palmhurst. It has to do something with, you know, the cities and stuff like that. But it can, Palmhurst continues to, continues to house the most famous resident. John H. Sherry, who commercialized the citrus industry in the area, forever changing the economic landscape of the Rio Grande Valley. So a little bit about mission here is way back in the days, we were nothing but orange growth. Uh, I mean, you, you could see it, there was miles and miles of nothing but orange trees everywhere. And that's just when I was little. My grandmother had has more stories about the whole orange growth and stuff. Like she says it was, I mean, just packed full of orange. We even have a, a orange juice factory here. It used to be uh, called uh, TCX. Now it's, uh, oh, dang, I don't even remember. But anyways, it has nothing to do with the paranormal. So let me get back on to here. Um, so... John H. Sherry built a mansion along the Palmhurst Main Road. When he died in 1945, his body was buried at the mausoleum located in the Sherry Chapel across from his house. His wife, Mary E. O'Brien, was laid to rest there as well. See, I didn't know he was buried right there. You know, I've passed that place so many times, and I've seen I've seen the Sherry's... Uh, out on their porch. <laughs> but of course, then again, it was about two in the morning to three o'clock in the morning. So yeah, freaked the shit out of me. One time I saw, I saw John H. Sherry uh, walking his dog supposedly across the street. And you know, I'll get into that right now. So um, John H. Sherry has been seen on a rocking chair of the porch outside his mansion and has been spotted getting up to walk to the lake outside his mansion. And in the grounds of the mausoleum, surrounded by citrus trees and dancing with his wife, Bao said. There are no, there's no tragic story here. He just loved the land so much that he keeps getting drawn into the, drawn to it and refuses to leave it. It is a welcome change of pace from some of the more gruesome stories. So, yeah, um, resid uh, how do you call it? A res residual ghost? <laughs> I guess he's a residual ghost. I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, if you love your property so much or if you love your, your, your state so much, I mean, why not? And I'm guessing that is John H. Sherry right there. And uh, let me give you a little fact. Um, I think my grandmother, um, she talked to uh, O'Brien before she passed away and stuff like that. I'm not sure uh, I, I could be wrong, but yeah. Uh, their mission is a pretty small town, you know. A lot of people know a lot of things around here, so. And... Guys, that's the end of my show. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. And uh, just remember, stay out of the ordinary. This is Mikey saying good night. Oh, oh, oh,